Good morning, Grace Gospel. It is good to see you guys. Welcome, 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 welcome. Glad that you are with us and here with us and able to worship with us. Why don't you guys stand up? We're going to take some time before our Lord this morning, get to worship Him and honor Him. And as we talked about last week, I don't know what kind of week you've had, but the invitation is to bring everything in and to lay it at the feet of Jesus. There was a, a guy in the Bible, there is a guy in the Bible named Job, and I won't explain your whole, his whole situation, but let's just say he had a really bad day. Like a Hurricane Katrina, like everything gets destroyed, job, people die, everything. Kind of a bad day. And uh, on a day when obviously you could be pretty upset and want to blame God and shake your fist, this is what his response was. It says, then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then I love this next verse. It says, and through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. And again, it's a reminder that uh, he is with us through everything, whether uh, whether it's stormy outside, whether it's sunny outside. And so we get, to, we get to worship. You know, we get to spend some time today and we get to come together as a congregation online and together in the house and, and we get to worship our God. And so I invite you to worship him. And again, I don't know what kind of week you've had. Uh, maybe it was the worst week ever. Maybe it was the best week ever. My guess is for most of us, it was someplace in between. Um, but either way, he's with us and we can worship him this morning. So let's pray. Father God, I love you. I thank you for your goodness and grace. I thank you for Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you have loved us and that you continue to love us no matter what. I thank you, Lord, that you've never, you promised never to leave us nor forsake us, and that means that we are yours and in Christ and that we can hold fast to you. So, Father, would you, would you come and just help us to see you clear? Lord, let us not as we said, leave everything outside, but Father, may we bring it in and lay it at your feet. We thank you, Father, with it. we can come before the throne of grace boldly, and we don't have to hold anything back, and we don't have to pretend that we don't have to act like something we're not, but instead that we can worship and glorify your name in who we are completely. Father, I do love you. I thank you so much for all you give us. May you be glorified today. In Jesus' name, amen. Morning, Grace. Good seeing you. We have the blessing of uh, worshiping the King today together in song. Please sing the song. Please. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. I was found in a desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will see. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. The sun is shining. Yes. 
Blessed be your name. Give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, the blessed be your name.
chain will break His broken heart to clear His praise Who could stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles and Every knee will bow before Him our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. ago we introduced the song Just Be and we like to sing it for a few weeks that way you guys can get to learn it and the first time that we sang it I read the first part of Psalm 4610 which says cease, cease striving and know that I am God or be still and know that I am God but yesterday I was reading it again and the second part is I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth and I know when I first started singing this song, I'm thinking, oh, it's great because I can just be at his feet and just be quiet and, and hear what he wants to say to me. And that's really important. But then yesterday I'm thinking, I could just be because he has it. You know, God wins in the end. So with all the craziness that's going on, we can not just sit back and go for the ride, but we can just be and stay in that confidence because he is in control.
everything else can wait. I've come to seek your face. So everything else can wait. I'm here for you. I want to just be here at your feet. Just be here on my knees. Here in your presence, I am complete. Jesus, you're all that I need. Everything else can wait. I've come to seek your face. So everything else can wait. I'm here. Nothing matters more. There's nothing I want more, God. There's nothing matters more. No. There's nothing I want more, more than you. There's nothing matters more. Nothing I want more Nothing matters more I'll just be here at your feet Just be here on my knees Here in your prayer here before you reminded of such truth this morning reminded of, of the simple fact that you are all that we need that if we if we know you if we have a relationship with you that's all we need and Lord to, to live in that is what we're called to do what you've commanded us to do and yes that requires us to to just be still before you but even as was mentioned, it requires us to, to truly just understand who you are and that you're in control, that you're on the throne, and that we come before you a holy and perfect God. And we are eternally grateful for that. And Lord, let us, let us live in light of that, realizing just what you've done and just who you are in our lives so that you can work in and through us, Lord. We love you today. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. Welcome this morning. Welcome to those of you joining us on Facebook Live today. We are so glad that you are here and decided to spend some of your Sunday morning 
with us. For those of us in-house this morning, if you are new or you're a visitor this morning, we do have a welcome card in every seat pocket in front of you. We would ask that you would just fill that out just so we can get to know you a little bit better, get some information, and you can get to know us a little better here at Grace Gospel Church with that as well. And you can either leave that on your seat or you can place it in one of the tithe boxes, either one on the back wall or one right up here to my right on the front wall up here. All right, and then we do have a couple announcements this morning. And so uh, Kingdom Kids, if you are not down in Kingdom Kids, I don't see anyone up here, but Kingdom Kids meets at our 11 a.m. service only right now. So that's for our newborn to preschoolers. And so that is downstairs for Kingdom Kids. And then uh, so we have a new way for you to register for Sunday morning service. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you go to gracegospelchurch.com, that's our website, uh, there is a way for you to register there. So this is just a screenshot of our website. This is what our home screen looks like. And then you can see there's a button just a half a scroll down. Uh, it says Sunday morning registration or Sunday service registration. So you can just click on that, and that's going to take you to this screen, which will give you three options to sign up. All right, so the first one being 9 a.m. service, the second one being our 11 a.m. service, and then our Kingdom Kids, which again is for our 11 a.m. service. So you can sign your children up for that. So spots are limited with that. There'll be a little countdown number of how many spots are remaining. But once you click on your option, then you get the option to you know, write in your name, your family name, uh, how many people are going to be coming, and then your email just so you can get a confirmation of your registration. So we are asking that we kind of go to that. That's just a really, really easy, super convenient way to sign up so that we can keep track of who is going to be here and what service you are going to be here. It does not take very long at all. It took me like three and a half seconds to, uh, to sign up. And so I don't know if anyone did it for this week, but uh, it does not take much. And uh, so, yeah, just a really easy way for us to sign up for service moving forward. All right, that's all we have this morning. We go ahead and pray, and Pastor Patrick's going to come and bring the message for us today. Pray with me. Lord, we love you, and we, we are just so, again, thankful to be here, thankful to be in your presence, to, to come at your feet, Lord, and, and to worship you, to worship you through song and now through the study of your word. Lord, we pray that you would just be with Pastor Patrick, just, just fill him with your spirit and your, your words, what you would have for us today as we continue in our Second Timothy series, Lord. Lord, we love you today, and we're, we're just thankful again to be here. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome again. Good to see you guys. Um, love being before our Lord with you guys. Just love being together and uh, just love that we get this chance, right? And uh, a lot of good things happening. This has kind of been the summer or going to be the summer of not much happening in church, but things are going to get normal again and we're going to get there. So that'll be all right. And uh, we'll see what God does through it even because of it. So we are almost to the end of our Second Timothy series. We started this way back in January, and then when COVID hit, we took a few months off to really, because we really felt like we just needed to concentrate on who Jesus is, and so we did the I Am series and, and allowed Jesus to talk to us about who he is, and then we've come back to this. And so it's been just a great study, and I'll remind you you know, that, that the whole point of this, the whole point of 2 Timothy was about um, this concentration of Paul to Timothy on multiplying God's kingdom, on building his kingdom. Not our kingdom. It's not about us. It's not about anything that we do. It's not about anything that we are. It's about his kingdom. As a matter of fact, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be the light of the world before God. We're supposed to be his light in this dying world. And so, uh, you know, that's Paul's focus, I'll remind you, this is his last letter. This is Paul's last letter. He's about to die, literally, within, the, within a few months to maybe even a few weeks sooner, you know, sooner than a few months, he's dead. And he knows he's going to die. He's in a situation in jail where it's not going to be, the, out, the outcome's not going to be that he's going to be released. And he understands that. He understands he's at the end of his life. And so he writes this letter to Timothy and, and really with this focus on the kingdom and this focus on what we've been called to be as the church of Jesus Christ. And uh, it it's really is the, the words of a dying man like we talked about last week. And it really is about this concentration on what do we do is we, we hear somebody if they're dying and they say I have something to tell you, you press in hard to that. 
And so last week we talked about that final charge, this culmination of, of, this, of this focus on, on kingdom ministry and on kingdom building, where Paul challenges Timothy in all of it, preach the word, preach the word, preach the word, preach the word, preach the word. It's the gospel that saves. It's the gospel that gives life. And so we need to preach the gospel. We need to share the good news of Jesus Christ in all that we do and in all that we are. That's what he's called us to. That's who we're called to be as the church of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, you understand that the church is not here so that we can huddle together and feel good together. I mean, praise God that we can get together, that we can encourage each other, that we can be with one another, where we can gather together and encourage one another in the faith. But we're here, and God's kept us here, and the purpose of the church is to be the light. It's to be the light to a dying world. It's to do what we're called to do in our mission statement, to exalt Christ in everything that we do, and to point others to him. That's what Christ has called us to do. To, in everything that we do, may it be to his honor, to his glory, to his majesty, to the name of Jesus, to exalt him in everything, and that when somebody comes or when we see somebody, we get to point them to Jesus, not to us. Because it's not about us. It's about him. We don't save. He does. And so that's what we're called to. And so how are we going to accomplish that? Like, how are we going to get to that place? You know, what's the, what's the road forward? In what way do we do that? And that's our, mission, our, our vision statement, which is we are called, we are called, brothers and sisters, to be men and women um, who are Holy Spirit empowered. And so we're called to be a Holy Spirit-empowered movement of God on mission to build his kingdom, to, to multiply his kingdom. That's what we're called to do. And we're, we're, we're called to do it in that way, right? We're called to exalt Christ and to, go, and, and, and to point others to him. And we're called to do it in a way where we are, we are Holy Spirit-empowered and that we're a Holy Spirit-empowered movement of God that moves for him on mission, Multiplying again, not our kingdom, because it's not about our kingdom, it's about his kingdom. And so that's what, that's what Paul has done. He has challenged Timothy to have this kingdom mindset, to be in this place where it's not about anything of us, but it's about building his kingdom. It's about being his light to the world. And he's given that final charge, and yet he still has a few more words. And so we're going to look at some of those today. We're going to do this week and next week. And... Um, because the question might be, but, but Paul, wait, 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 are you giving up? Are you kind of checking out? Are you kind of bowing out? And, and the reality is he, he is at the end of his life, and so he is definitely passing this mantle to Timothy and to the church as a reminder of what we need to be and how we need to focus. It's an absolute uh, passing of the mantle. And what Paul does for just a few seconds at the end of this charge is he takes a step back and he begins to contemplate or evaluate his life and, and, and begin to summarize his life. And he does that by looking at the present, the past, and the future in that. And just a few verses. And I, and I feel like this is just a great passage to concentrate on and to think about as, as we think about us. And about how we're going to finish. And so if you have your Bibles, if you would open up to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to talk about today finishing well. Finishing well. I, I, I said a few weeks ago that the end is near. The end is near. And, and uh, that is true of whether Jesus is going to return sometime soon or whether you're going to go see him. Because one of the two is going to happen. Not that far in the future. Now, even if you're young and you go, whoa, I got maybe 60, 70, 80 years left, and you might, but in the course of eternity, that is nothing. That is a blip. And so it is near. I was uh, listening again to Chronicles of Narnia, and we were just going someplace, and I said, hey, you want to listen? And uh, um, one of the characters, Aslan, is the lion, the, you know, the representation of Jesus, and He's like, I got to go now. And she's like, but, but oh, I can't take it. When, when will we see you again? And, and he says, it'll be near. You know, near. And he says, she says, well, well when, what, what is near? And he says, I call all times 
near. <laughs> right? It's coming soon. And so the question is, are we going to finish well? Very few of us are going to have like this, this, uh, ever, this thing of, hey, you have two years to live. You have five years to live. You have ten years to live. This is the date. We don't, we don't get that kind of stuff. We don't know when we're going to die. And so the reality is several of us might be at the end right now. And the question is, are we going to finish well? So the, 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 the reality is, how do we finish well in the midst of not knowing when the end is? And so that's what Paul contemplates on as he really is at the end, and yet he can look back. So look with me in this. I just love what he does. Again, how he summarizes his life and how he goes through this. First, he looks at the, at the now. And, and, you know, he is real about his situation, And his attitude toward this situation, toward this present time, is resolve. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a good way. Look at this, verse 6. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Paul, what about you? Are you checking out? He says, well, God's going to take me out. The, the, The time for my departure has come. And I love this, right? Because he's not, like I said, this is not resolve in a bad way. He's ready to die. He's ready to die. He's ready to go meet Jesus. He's ready to go be with his Savior. He's ready to be face to face with the Lord. And he's not, he's not holding back from that. And I love what he says. He says he's already being poured out as a drink offering. Already being poured out. It's time for him to go. And I love this because if you compare it with Philippians chapter 2, verse 17. And this is where, in, in Philippians, when he's writing to the Philippi church, I should say, he's in jail. He's in a, but he's under house arrest. And so it's kind of a different situation. He doesn't anticipate death here, but he says this. He says, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, even if I'm, if I'm being poured out in that way as a drink offering, upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you and with all of you. So he's really not thinking he's going to die, but he says, even if I was the going to, even if I was going to do that, my life is an offering to him. And because of that, I'll rejoice. I'll rejoice all the way unto death. I'll rejoice all the way unto death. You know, it, it, one of the things with this, this COVID thing that has come up, and I got to tell you, and, and, and I've said this, I've said this in sermons a few months ago, um, you know, we, we would have prayer meetings on the phone and, and, and in the very beginning, and, and, and you could hear the fear in people's voices. You could hear the fear. I mean, it was a weird time, right? I mean, like, nobody knew what was, gonna ha- what was happening. This big wave was crashing, and everything was closed. Everybody's locked up. Everybody's not sure what's going to happen. If you, if you have any kind of illness, you never know. We, we knew people that got sick. Um, and there was a real fear. And, and, and I, I, I get it. I get fear. You know, I get the fear of the unknown, and I don't know. But there's a little bit of a concern for me. In the church, in the sense that we allow fear to drive us. And we're so scared of dying that we won't allow Christ to do something and to live in us. And we can't be ever in that place where we're so afraid to die because I don't have to be afraid to die. He says, listen, if I'm being poured out as a drink offering, and I love what that means, that, that the, the, in the Greek, the phrase, I'm being poured out like a drink, is one word in the Greek, and, it, and it, it's a picture of the drink offering being poured on the lamb of sacrifice just before it was burned on the altar. That's the picture there. And Paul says, listen, I'm going to live all the way for Jesus to the very end, and I'm going to be a drink offering to him. And if God's going to sacrifice my body, if he's going to take me out, he's not taking me out and like I'm lost then. I get to be with him. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But, but I don't have to be afraid of it because I'm with him. And so I'm going to live without fear to the very end, to the very end with my Lord and Savior, even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering. That word departure, as it says back in 2 Timothy, he says, for the time of my departure has come. That word departure literally means to unloose. 
It's used of a, a ship throwing off her cables or of soldiers breaking down camp for departure. Listen, Paul understood this very important thing that the church of Jesus Christ has got to capture. Death is not the end. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've accepted him as your Savior and your King, then you become a child of God, and, and, and death is no longer has any power over us. Because we will be with him forever. That's why Paul can say in, in Philippians, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live, and if I'm going to live, if God, every breath that God lets me have on this earth, I'm going to honor him with that. But you know what? To die would be better because I get to be. It's not, it's not about hastening death. It's not about wanting to hasten death. It's this healthy understanding, though, that when I die, I'll be with him. And so I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be fearful of anything. A lot of us grew up in churches where, where we called um, people saints, but the, the saints were those special people that had already died, and they had some sort of magical, miraculous property. But it's not biblical. You know what's biblical? You know what a saint is in Scripture? It's someone who's accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a citizen of heaven today. Today, heaven is mine. Matter of fact, that's why Paul can call it home, to get to go home to Jesus. Home before my God. Home where there's real rest and there's real comfort and there's real peace. Where it says in Revelation, there'll be no more tears. Every tear will be wiped away. No more pain. No more sorrow. Paul knew that. And so Paul could boldly walk into that. He understood that death was a, a glorious beginning in the presence of God, physically in presence of God. And so he, he knew not to hold too tightly onto this world. Like, I, again, I'm, I'm so... There's just a, a thing in the church today where we hold tightly to this world. We told, hold tightly to the things that we are, and we forget that we're a citizen of heaven. A Christian should never, ever be afraid of death. Ever. Because that's the beginning of eternity for us. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord, Paul says. How good is that? Right? And so Paul has this resolve about the end. Not a fearful death. I mean, he, he, listen, he's, you know, his death wouldn't be pretty. You know, it wasn't like he was going to fall asleep. He didn't. He was killed for the faith. But he's not looking at that. He's looking at what it brings. Look, this is the end, Lord. I'm going to be with you. How, how, not, how could you not rejoice in that? All right, so his attitude toward the present is that resolve of that just, this glorious resolve and this glorious peace in Jesus then he goes on and he gives an assessment of his past, an assessment of real faithfulness for himself and that. And you, know, you, you, ever, you ever think, boy, what would you want people to say at your funeral? What would you want people to say about you after you're dead? And so there were these three guys standing around one day, and they were meeting, they were Christians, and they were talking about this and about what, what do we want God to what, what do you want? And so they each went around and shared what they each wanted someone to say. And the first guy said, you know, I, I want people to talk about how I was just a great father. And I was a man of God with my wife and my children. And I was a great father. And I was there. And I was faithful. And I would just love for people to be able to say that. And they said, what about you? And the next guy says, well, I would love people to talk about how I was just a man of integrity in my business. And I just did it right. And I just honored God. And, and I was integrious about all that I did. And, and God was glorified in that. And they said, you know, the two sat there. And they said, that's what we'd love. And so they said to the third guy, hey, what would you want people to say about you at your funeral as they walked by your casket? He said, you know what I want them to say? Hey, look, he's moving. <laughs> Get it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to tell a joke every once in a while. Come on now, right? So <laughs> all I got is bad ones. Sorry. Can you imagine Paul as he contemplates 
about what people are going to say. Because this is what Paul says about himself. In this contemplation, how, would, you, would you want any other words than these words said about you? Wouldn't, wouldn't these be great? Look at what he says, verse 7. This is his evaluation of where he is at the end of his life in Jesus Christ. He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. And those are some great words. I get chills even reading them and to think about, God, how I would so want to be a man where, you know, listen, I don't need extraordinary things said, right? I mean, we don't. I mean, and we, because we all know that as soon as someone dies, all of a sudden everybody says all the great stuff about them and they forget all the garbage about them, right? Well, trust me, I'm not the best thing in the world, right? I, I love the, the videos or the, 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 the things that come out and they say, listen, when I die, please don't tell everybody I was a saint because I wasn't all the time. Right? It's just not true. But I sure would love for someone to say, you know what, at least Patrick, he fought the good fight. He finished the course. He kept the faith. And I, I love these words, and these are significantly important. And, and these words can be looked at two ways. Um, two ways are valid, and they have been by different commentators. The, the first can be that it just looked as a strict athletic metaphor where Paul has fought the good fight. He's, he's remained on the course, and he's remained true to God. But I, I think, though, it's probably more that he's talking about what he was talking about earlier in the passage or earlier in the book in this letter to Timothy. Because earlier on, he challenges Timothy looking forward about how he's to live and to remain. And so flip back just a page where you are. Just flip back a page to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at what he does. He says this, as he challenges Timothy toward this focus and faithfulness to kingdom multiplication. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So I love the focus right there, right? There's a focus on discipleship, and, and I love the, the generations there. It's Paul teaching Timothy, who can teach somebody else, who can teach somebody else. It's just, it, that's kingdom multiplication. You know, I'm not just trying to pass it on to one. I'm trying to pass it on to one, but so that that person can pass it on to somebody else who can pass it on. And so that's the challenge there of this kingdom multiplication to be kingdom-minded, to be kingdom-focused, right? We're called to be a, a church that is a, that is a, um, a Holy Spirit-empowered movement of God on mission to build his kingdom, to, to multiply his kingdom. That's what we're called to do, right? And that's how you do that. Well, how are we going to stay on that course? Well, and this is his challenge to Timothy in 2 in 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at it. So first thing he says, he says, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him. As a soldier, I fought the good fight. He's been a, a soldier in the army of God and he has lived a life of focus. I lived a life of kingdom focus before his God. I love that. He's not gotten caught up in the things of the world. He's not gotten caught up in the, in the entanglements of it all. He has made Christ first in his life and made the kingdom of God and multiplying the kingdom of God his priority. He's fought the good fight. He's not, he's not been entangled. Listen, as a soldier, you can't, you've got to focus on the enemy. You've got to focus on the battle that's before you. And the reality is, is that we're not going to be in the battle one day. We're in the battle now. And we've got to understand that. So we've got to remain focused before him. And Paul says that he has fought the good fight. He has been one that has focused on God and kept that focus before him. He says he's finished the race. Look at what it says in verse 5 as he's challenging Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 5, as he challenges Timothy forward, he says, Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. 
He's finished the race. In other words, he's lived a life of obedience. He's run the whole race. He's run that race to the end. He's run it to the end. He's been a man that stayed on the course. He didn't go to the left. He didn't try to make his own course. He stayed on God's course, and he, and he ran it to the end in, in obedience to God. You know, God doesn't give prizes for, for running halfway. He's not looking for starters. He's not looking for someone who will run a little bit and run off the course. He's looking for somebody who will finish, who will run it to the end, because that's where the prize is. I've... Um, I've run a few half marathons in my older, or younger life, I should say. My older life, I'm way past that. I'm done with those things. Things hurt too much. Um, <laughs> I don't even like running on the road anymore, right? Treadmills and, and ellipticals, that's, that's my future, right, from all my pain. But um, I did run a few half marathons uh, right after I moved here uh, 10 years ago or so. And, and, and so I was thinking about it, and and as, as this prize that we get, right, this, this one for completing, because that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to complete the race, right, because you only get a prize for completing the race. And at the Hampton Marathons, they, they give you a, a, a medal for all who finish. They don't give you a medal for signing up. They give you a medal for not just starting, but for completing. When you cross the finish line with the time, because they got a, a tracker on you, you know, and all that kind of stuff. They give you a medal that, that you've run it. And, and, and it doesn't even say marathon because there's other people who are running the marathon. I don't even understand those people. Like running a full marathon, forget it. Um, I had people ask me, are you going to run a full marathon? No. Um, half marathon? Yes. Right? I did that a few times. Uh, and I get the prize because that's what you do. And so that's what happens. You, 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 Paul has finished the race and he's finished strong. Because he's run in obedience to God. And then he says, as he's looking back, he's kept the faith. Well, look at what he says to Timothy in this challenge. Verse 6, he says, The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive the share of his crops. Um, the hardworking farmer. So I, I don't know much about farming. Most of us probably don't know much about farming. And I, actually, I should say I didn't know much about farming. I know a little bit now because God, uh, in, in his, in his uh, um, you know, just sending us out, uh, for six and a half years, we spent time in Minnesota. Not Minneapolis, Minnesota, but northwest Minnesota, north of Fargo, where it's all, all crop and, and land. And, and I learned about farming there a little bit, just a little bit. And, and what I learned is, is that you've got to, I mean, farmers work hard. We all kind of know that, right? There's kind of this understanding. But they have a very specific season of growth. And so when that season comes, everything before that is preparation to that season. And when that season hits, it's go time. Because they've got to do everything that they can do to prepare this crop to be the best that it can be. And so they, they, they till and they harvest, you know, they, they till and they, they, they cultivate and they, they plant and they do all that they need to do, not in that order, but in, all that they need to do to make sure that crop. Now listen, they can't make the sun shine and they can't make the rain fall out of the sky. They also cannot hold back hail and, and all kinds of damaging stuff. They can't do that. But they have to make sure they do everything that they can do to make it well. Because if you don't put it in the ground, it ain't going to happen. If you don't till the ground properly, if you don't fertilize the ground, if you don't cultivate, if you're not ready to harvest when it's time, it's not going to come out. But, it's, but what a life of faith. Because they needed to work hard. And let me tell you, they worked hard. They worked hard. And in that hard working... If God blessed, they received the reward of that, the, the 30, the 60, the 100-fold that Jesus talks about in his planting illustrations. I got to tell you, kingdom work is hard work. And, and um, listen, every once in a while, I'll ask somebody to do something, or, 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 or I'll know it's hard on them, and I'll, I'll say I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm going to tell you a secret, all right? So not many people know this. I don't tell anybody. Promise? Good. Um, um, I'm not really sorry. 
I'm really not. I, I gave that up a long time ago. I mean, it's going to take sacrifice and it's going to take work. And it's not just supposed to be the pastor or a few special people that give that sacrifice. It's supposed to be the church. It's supposed to be the church who works for the Lord and to do what they're called to do. And listen, please hear this. If you're not called to do something, don't do it. Don't do it. But I got to tell you, if you are gifted and you are called to do something, don't not do it. Well, it's going to be hard. It's going to take time. Yes, it is. It's going to take sacrifice. Yes, it is. And I I almost said it right there, and I'm sorry about that. Actually, I'm not sorry about that. I'm not, because God has called us to this, and it's worth it. It's worth it. The hardworking farmer should be the one to receive part of the crop, you know, the first fruits of the crop. The, the enjoyment of that. It means, it means keeping at it. It means, it means even, even before others, even when others want you to quit, even when your, your body says to quit, it means keeping at it. It means working hard so that you can do what you need to do. Because the time is short. The growing season is short. It means growing and learning about ourselves and in ourselves and then living it out before others. Paul's worked hard, and he's trusted in God to do his part. Paul has done what God has called him to do, and the rest is up to Jesus. We need to be a people, and that's why he can say, I fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. I've kept the faith. He's been faithful. And i got to tell you, the key to being faithful And to finishing well is starting well and maintaining well all throughout. All right, so that's his assessment of the past. And then he has an assessment of his future. And his assessment of his future is reward. Look at what he says. He says in verse 8, In the future there is also laid up for me a crown, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And, and hear these words. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Oh, I love that, right? This isn't about a special class. The reward of the glory and the future of God is not just for the special. It is for all who receive him and who come to him and who know him. Paul understands that his reward is a heavenly one. So often our world puts so much emphasis on what we have now. And again, another concern I have for the church is that we're, and and this is why we're afraid of death, because we're so holding on to the things of this earth. We're so holding on to the things of this that we want that. We think that we should have all the blessings of this earth. We think it should be easy. With too many of us, too many people in the church of Jesus Christ today think of God like this, like this gumball machine. That if I just do this, then I'll get this out of it. That if I just, if I just do this for Jesus, then he's obligated to give this to me. Because, because that's my reward. My reward is for it to be easier, to be, have good, or to have more on this earth. That is not your reward. Your reward is a heavenly one. Your reward is what God gives you in heaven. And too often, too many people in Jesus Christ, too many Christians, too many believers in God, are not focused on what they will have, but are focused on what they will get now. What they have now. Oh, God, forgive us. Forgive us for for concentrating on the things of now. As a matter of fact, look what it says in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 verse 1 says this. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. A reward that we want, the the praise of man. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. He said, so when you give to the poor, not if, but when, do not sound the trumpet before you as hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, so to be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they will have their reward or they have their reward in full. Look at what he's saying. 
He says, don't do something for the reward of mankind. Don't do something for the reward of somebody around you. Don't do something for praise or for thanks or for anything or even for material reward. You do it for the kingdom of God and for his glory. It's worth the sacrifice. It's worth the sacrifice. So that's why Jesus says a little bit later on in the same passage, in verse 19, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. The, the things of this earth are so temporary. They're so temporary. He says, Rather, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, nor, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Listen, the things of this earth are going away. They're going away. They're not going to last into eternity. The, the things that we trifle with, the things that we play with, the things that we put so much stock in, they're here today, but they're going to be gone tomorrow. I want to hold on to things that will really last, the things that will be in eternity with us, the things that will, will lead us to his glory. I love this. Paul says and back in 2 Timothy, he says, there's a crown laid up for me, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will award me on that day. Now, understand, that's not a royal crown. It, it's a, a laurel wreath that's given to the winner of the marathon race. You know, the great news is that, as, as Paul says, it's not, the prize is not just for the, for the best. Right? He says, it's not just only for me, because... Because in, in some senses, I mean, you know, you could argue about who is the best to follow Jesus. Uh, well, Paul's got to be up there, <laughs> right? Paul says, listen, it's not just for me. It's for everybody. It's like, that, it's like that medal at the marathon, right? It's to everybody who finishes. It's to everybody who, who finishes the race. It's for us. For all who finish. The kingdom of heaven is not about the best. It's not about some special people. It's not about these, these, these specific ones. It's about those who trust in Jesus. It's about those who are faithful and who run the course. God's not looking for champions. He's looking for competitor, uh, competitors. And, and really, he's looking for completers. I, um, I've been a pastor a long time. Uh, Back when I was young, I was 29 years old, and I, I, I uh, got my first pastorate. Clinton Corners, right outside of Poughkeepsie. And um, there was a man who was serving before me named Jack Ludlam. Jack Ludlam um, uh, was an older man. I forget how old he was when he ended up passing away, but um, he had been a pastor in the United States. When he retired from being a pastor in the United States, he went to the mission field. And he pastored and, uh, and worked with, if those of you who are old, old enough Christians to remember Transworld Radio, worked with Transworld Radio missionaries and pastored them for a lot of years. And, but he was home back in the United States because he was on terminal leave. Jack had bone cancer. And Jack was going to die. And Clinton Corners Evangelical Free Church was without a pastor, and so they asked if he would fill in. And, and Jack, for the last nine months... Uh, well, for, for, let me think of this, for eight months of the last 12 months of his life, was the, was the interim pastor at Clinton Corners Evangelical Free Church, for the last month of, of his preaching at Clinton Corners, he had to sit down on a stool. I remember seeing him that January, and uh, I went there August 1st, Jack passed away in October but uh, of that same year. Um, I remember being there in, in January, and we had some friends with us at the church. We were visiting up from, from uh, South Carolina, where I had gone to graduate school. And, and uh, I remember my, our, our friends saying, you know, when he first got up, stood up to preach, I didn't know how it would go because he looked so frail. 
But when he preached, it was like fire in his soul. Jack, just because that was his heart, and he would just preach. And, and literally, he preached until he couldn't preach anymore. And then, and then four months or so later in October, he passed away. And I, I got to tell you, Jack was the first funeral I ever did. They, they allowed me, this young 29-year-old kid, to do his funeral. Even though they had men from Trans World Radio come, and they had people from all over the world, you know, different ministry. Every ministry that he had been in, he pastored four churches. They had all sent people there. Uh, and they let me do the service. And I was like, man, what a, what a, what a privilege. Um, I went there August 1st, and for my commissioning service, they asked Jack for a verse or, or a quote or something that they could put on the front of the bulletin you know, for the commissioning service that they were going to have for me. And Jack gave them this quote. I don't remember who it was from, or even if it was anonymous or not. I don't remember who, where it was from. Um, I'll never forget it. But this was the quote. Jack had him put on there, God is not looking for a man who can do everything. He's looking for a man who will do anything. God's not looking for the superstar, right? Like God needs, you know, I, I, I hear people, well, I, I want to do something for Jesus, but I'm not as good as, well, most of us aren't, right? I mean, there's a whole lot better preachers out there. There's a whole lot of better everything out there. I mean, I know there's a best of something. I just don't know where they are, you know? God's not looking for the superstar. He's looking for the competitor, though, who's willing to get in the race and say, Lord, I'm going to do whatever you want to do because I'm going to let you do it through me, God. I'm going to allow you to work in me. I'm just going to give you what I can, and I'm going to allow you to do it. God doesn't need somebody who's great for a moment. As a matter of fact, God doesn't need your help. It is the privilege that God gives us to be able to serve him, to be able to be used of God as the hands and feet of God. He doesn't need help. He just wants us to be, he needs, because he's chosen it this way, he needs instruments who are willing to be used in the hand of God. Matter of fact, understand this. Your job, brothers and sisters, my job is not to do the impossible. I'm not God and neither are you. Our job is to do the possible in the name of Jesus to, the, to exalt his name and to glorify his name. And he'll do the impossible. He'll do what we can never do. He'll produce the increase, not us. How do we do that? How do we do that? It's so hard in this world. There's so many distractions there's so much happening. Hebrews chapter 12. It's a great reminder as he gives us in chapter 11 this great hall of faith. He then says this. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. I love that because it reminds us. I mean, you know, we're Christians, right? So we would go, of course we shouldn't be sinning. I mean, we struggle with sin. All of us struggle with sin. But we know that we shouldn't sin. And, and if you don't know you shouldn't sin, that's a whole different issue, right? But we, we pretty much across the board in the church of Jesus Christ, we know. But he reminds us, it's not only about sin, it's about the encumbrances. It's about the things that might not be evil, but they're also not good for us. For where God wants us to take. I remember when I first started running long, and it wasn't until I moved here 10, almost 11 years ago that I said, you know, I, I, there were some people in this church that had run half marathons, and I was like, if you could run a half marathon, I could run a half marathon. Um, they weren't the, they didn't look like runners, right? They just didn't, some of them. Well, one person that I met. Anyway, um, but this woman who ran long, and she was a runner, so she, I started doing that, and, 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 and I don't know if I was talking. I remember, I forget the context, but she said to me, there's a few things you got to know. And the first thing she says, she said to me was cotton kills. Like, like the mantra of, of runners is cotton kills. Now, I had been running for years, two, two and a half, three miles, never more than three. 
you know, but I'd been running for years, and, you know, you just slip on your cotton socks, and you slip on your cotton shirt, and you go run, right? Well, not when you run long, because cotton gets wet, and it gets heavy, and it starts to rub, and it starts to chafe, and you begin to get sores, and you'll begin to bleed, and, and your feet, oh, man, your feet, cotton kills. If you're going to run long, you don't wear cotton. You, 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 you remove every encumbrance. You remove the things that will hinder. And so you start buying runner's socks, and I started buying this stuff, and I was like, what? I, I, like, I'm not really a runner, and I'm really not a runner. You should see me run. It's really kind of funny. Um, my wife is a runner. Boy, she would, she, we would run together when we were younger, and she has bad knees, but she would run, and, and she would just glide through the thing. And I'd be like, can you please breathe? Because I was, <gasps> you know, I'm just not a runner, but... But I knew if I was going to run, I'd better, I'd better run the right way because I can't afford to have something weigh me down. That's how it is in Christ. We need to get rid of every encumbrance, the things that take our distractions and our time away from Jesus. I got to tell you, all of us have one of those things in our pocket or in our pocketbook, in our thing. It's called a, a, a smartphone. And, and it's a tool of Satan at times because it distracts us from interacting with actual people. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Run with endurance, because it's a marathon, it's a race. The Christian life is not a flash in the pan, it's a long journey. How do we do that? He continues in verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, by the way, was focused, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of God. Do you know what the joy before him was? It was you. It was me. Who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross for you and me. So that we could have life. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the, the author and perfecter. Christ has called us to this life. A life where we would be focused and kingdom minded. A, a, a life where we would be his light. That we would shed the encumbrances and that we would get rid of the sin. Get rid of the sin. And run with endurance, the race set before us. I don't, I don't know what you hope uh, others will say about you on your deathbed or at, at your funeral when you pass. But I sure hope it will be words like this. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. May we, may we have those words. See, and, and the way you do that is not at the end trying to get it back. It's by doing it now. It's by living well now. Finishing well is really kind of a, a misnomer. You don't finish well unless you've run well. You don't finish with anything left in the tank, right? Right? In the Air Force, we have to do, um, we have to run, uh, we have to do PT test every year. And when I was back in the beginning, when I first became a chaplain, we were in, in school, and, and uh, we had this one person who was always bumping on time. I mean, right at the very end, like would, would just barely make it or not make it. And so, you know, we were a team, and we're trying to encourage, and we're trying to push. And the problem was when, when they finished, they finished with a smile on their face because everybody's cheering for them. If you're finishing with a smile on your face, you got more in the tank. I mean, you, you can't be like, oh, yeah, hey, how you doing? You know, and I mean, listen, if you run that fast that you can finish with great time, then go ahead and smile. The point is you can't be like pushing up against time and like not giving it your all. As a matter of fact, on a PT test, you can't not give it your all. I, when I played baseball, my coach used to say, I've told you this before, leave it all in the field. Leave it all in the field. I don't know about you. I don't want to back into heaven. 
I mean, I don't want to be like, hey, hey, Jesus, I finished. Huh? What? Oh, when'd you get here? Uh, you know, it's not going to be like that, okay? But, <laughs> but I, I just don't, I, mean, I want to run head on. I want to be that competitor and that warrior for Jesus that, like, to the very end, God, I'm yours. And even use my death for your glory to build your kingdom, to multiply your kingdom. The way to finish well is to live well. And if you'll do that, if, listen, you don't have to go through life wording, wondering about what people will say about you. You just live well before Jesus. You run with endurance. You fix your eyes on him. You exalt him in everything you do, and you point others to him. You live a life that's a Holy Spirit-empowered movement of God on mission to multiply his kingdom. And what will be said are things like this. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Let me pray. Father God, I love you. I thank you for your glory and grace. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for Oh, God, for your love for us. Lord, we, are, we have not been perfect, Lord. We're so sorry for that. But, Lord, Father, help us to run well. Help us to, help us to focus on you. Help us to get rid of these things that are distractions to us. Get rid of the sin in our lives, Lord. Let us run. Because if we're going to finish well, it's because we're running well now. So, Lord, let us do that to your glory. Let us, let us run the race for you, that you would be exalted, that others would be pointed to you. Father, I love you so much. Empower us to do that right now for your grace and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please rise for the last song? This last song is such a great song. It's a the song of Jesus' life. And uh, every time I play it, I just, uh, it speaks to me more and more every time I play it of just exactly what he's done for me, what he's done for you, the sacrifice that he's given so that we could be with him in heaven. So please sing this song with us. Oh, glorious day. 
death could not hold him, the grave could not keep him, rising again, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified. day indeed father that we have to to look forward to because of what you've done for us coming into our world coming on a rescue mission for us so that if we believe in you we may have eternal life Lord, we love you today we're so thankful for for the calling that you've placed on our lives as followers of you that if we are in a relationship with you then we have the responsibility of, of living you out here on this earth uh, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to give it everything that we have for you, to be so focused and kingdom-minded on who you are, Lord, that we live you out each and every single day, no matter where we find ourselves, Lord, no matter what this world throws at us, no matter what world we live in, Lord, we know that, you're, that we are yours, that you are on the throne, that you are in control, and that we can live for you. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. I just wanted to close with a couple verses from Colossians chapter 3 this morning. Verses 23 and 24 says this. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as, a, as if you are working for the Lord, not for human masters. Verse 24, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a, re as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. And I love the way it ends like that. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. It's not for anyone in this world but him. And so we have the responsibility to take action. You know, it's a great message this morning, but it's a call to action even to live for him in, in our homes, in our workplace, in our schools, wherever it may be, to just take Jesus with you, to be his representative here on this earth. And so go and do that this week. Thank you for being here this morning. Hope you have a great day. You are dismissed. Mm -hmm.